So now that we've covered the general's concepts associated with filtration, recall again filtration is the movement of fluid out of the glomerular capillary into the tubular lumen. Let's now talk about the next process, which is reabsorption. And remember that with filtration, we said that a typical amount of filtrate that forms over the period of a day is about 180 liters. Now clearly, none of us are going to be excreting that amount of urine. As a matter of fact, the typical urine output is approximately a liter and a half, which means that over the course of the day, we are having to reabsorb an incredibly large amount of fluid. So reabsorption is a very important process to help us maintain homeostasis. So let's look at reabsorption in general first. So approximately 70% of reabsorption of substances occur in the proximal tubule. About 25% of reabsorption occurs in the thick portion of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. So this accounts for about 95% of reabsorption, and for the most part, this is what we refer to as unregulated process. We are left with about 5% of the filtrate that we filter out, and this 5% is what we are going to be able to have a significant effect as, with regards to regulating this. So what we mean by regulation and non-regulation, regulation means we have the ability based on need to either increase or decrease the amount of fluid we reabsorb or the amount of substances we reabsorb. So for the most part, 95% of what we reabsorb is not regulated. There's some minor exceptions which we'll point out and only about 5% is regulated. Now if 70% of this Now, if we look at the proximal tubular cells, which is what I've drawn here, what we're going to see is, is that there's a couple of different major ways that we may reabsorb substances. The first is by what we call transcellular transport. So transcellular transport means that we are going to be transporting material, and it's going to go through the cell which means it's going to be crossing the apical membrane, which is the membrane facing the tubular lumen, as well as we're going to have to move it across the basolateral membrane, and this will be moving it to the interstitial space, subsequently be taken away by the peritubular capillaries. The other type of transport is called paracellular transport, and para typically means beside, so this will be transport that does not go across the apical and basolateral membranes, rather it's going between the cells. Now let's look more closely at transcellular transport. So there are going to be some substances that we see that are in a high concentration in the tubular fluid, and if they're going to be transported trans, through the transcellular route, they're going to have to cross this apical membrane. So we're going from a high concentration to a low concentration in this mode. But when we were going to push this back out across into the interstitial fluid, we then be going from a low concentration to a high concentration. So with this in mind, we could see that we can cross the apical membrane by a passive process, but the basolateral process is going to have to require active transport. Now there's going to be other substances that are in low concentration inside the tuber lumen, and they're going to need to get across that apical membrane. They're going to be going against a, a gradient, and that's going to require active transport. But then to go across the basolateral membrane, it's going to be going down its gradient so it can be passive. So what we might be able to see looking forward here is there may be some substances that are going to be passively move across this apical membrane, but this may then provide energy to allow the active transport of another substance. So that's what we learned in our first module as an example of secondary active transport. And if they're both moving in the same direction, that would be co-transport. Finally, if we look at paracellular transport, these are going to be substances that are going to be moving between cells. And so this, in this example, we may see a substance that's in a high concentration inside the tubular lumen and a low concentration in the interstitial fluid and so it may have the potential to be able to just diffuse between the cells, which would be a passive process.
Now, I don't, though I don't demonstrate this on any of the slides, once we get this material to the interstitial space, it easily gets into the peritubular capillaries and then is taken back to the body in general. Now, we mentioned that about 70% of reabsorption occurs in the proximal tubule and about 5% occurs in the distal tubule. So with that in mind, it shouldn't be surprising to think that there's going to be some structural differences between the cells that line these different places. So one of the things we'll first notice is that where we see most reabsorption in the proximal tubule, we're going to see a much greater surface area. So the microvilli of the apical membrane are going to be much more developed. So that provides more surface area, which will allow it to be easier to reabsorb more material. The apical membrane on the distal tubular cells are much less developed with regards to their microvilli, so not nearly as much surface area. Second, both of these areas have tight junctions between the cells. But there's actually a difference between the type of tight junctions that are present. So in our distal tubule cells, where we have very little reabsorption occurring, those tight junctions are really tight junctions. These really limit, strictly limit, the movement of material between cells. But in the proximal tubule, we refer to these as leaky tight junctions. So although they may put up some resistance to material moving between the cells, they actually allow many things to go through quite freely. So we refer to those as leaky tight junctions. Finally, recall that when we have transcellular transport occurring, we mentioned that we are going to require pumps or active transport across the basolateral membrane. And we're going to see one of those major things that utilizes that is the sodium-potassium pump. So in order to make that work properly, we have to have lots of ATP. So what we'll see is in those proximal tubular cells, we're going to have lots of mitochondria compared to the amount of mitochondria present in the distal tubular cells. So these are some of the major structural differences um, that correlate with what goes on functionally in different portions of the nephron. So filtration is a movement of material out of the glomerulus into Bowman space. Reabsorption is taking material out of the tubular lumen and putting it back into the peritubular capillaries. And then secretion is when we're putting material back into the tubular lumen itself. So with secretion, this is primarily going to be occurring in the proximal tubule as well as in the distal portion of the nephron, which will include both the distal tubule and the collecting duct. Some of the primary substances that we're going to see are secreted are hydrogen ions, potassium ions, as well as ammonia. And one that I don't have listed here is also bicarbonate. So these are going to be the major substances that we're going to talk about with regards to secretion. So the role of secretion is going to be particularly to help us maintaining potassium homeostasis as well as helping us with acid-base balance. Now finally, another term that I would like for you to understand has to do with the amount of substance that we filter into Bowman space. So filtration again is the movement of material out of the glomerular capillaries into the tubular lumen, which would be in Bowman space. And the amount of total, the total amount of substance that we filter, we refer to as the filtered load. And the way that we can calculate the total amount of a substance that's filtered is we can take the plasma concentration of a substance. Okay, that plasma concentration is often going to be uh, listed as in milligrams per milliliter. So we measure that by simply obtaining a blood test and then we multiply that times the glomerular filtration rate, which is in milligrams per minute. So if we multiply the plasma concentration times the glomerular filtration rate, we will get what's called the filtered load. So in this case, if we were calculating the filtered load of, of this substance X, we take its concentration in milligrams per milliliter and multiply it times the glomerular filtration rate, which is milliliters per minute. The milliliters would cross out, and that would give us a filtered load in the units of milligrams per minute. So that would be 
what we're going to do is use that number. We can use that number, the filtered load, which is the amount that actually makes it into the renal tubule, and we can compare that to the amount that actually shows up in the urine, or the amount that's excreted. So a common test that's done to evaluate a patient's kidney function, if, if we're searching deeper for what might be going on with their kidneys, is we will have the patient collect what we call a 24-hour urine. So we'll collect their urine over a 24-hour period. That can be sent to the lab, and they can measure the total amount of a substance, of various substances within the urine, and we can compare that to the filtered load of those substances. And by comparing those two numbers, it helps us assess what parts of the kidney might be having difficulties. So if the amount that's filtered is, say, less than, the, if the filtered load is less than the amount excreted, then that would tell us that that substance is basically undergoing net reabsorption. If the amount excreted is greater than the filtered load, then that would tell us that that substance is undergoing net secretion.